The following is a special focus presentation. It began to be used by Christians in the fourth century, stigmata, marks which mysteriously began to appear on people which resembled the wounds and the pain that Jesus sustained during his crucifixion. These are microscope slide samples. When I first took a look at them, I can remember coming across a large, a large deposit of blood on the cloth. And when I looked at the blood through my microscope with the thought I could look through backwards into 2,000 years of history and uh, actually see the blood of Christ. Those afflicted, called stigmatists, developed injuries on their hands, wrists, and feet where the nails were driven in, on the sides where the spear had penetrated, on the shoulders and the back where the scourging had ripped the skin, and sometimes on the forehead where the crown of thorns had been placed. Along with the marks, there is often blood, or at least what appears to be blood, sometimes on the skin and other times visible just beneath it. A reliable approved list does not exist but an unofficial roster has been assembled. There are about 300 names on it. St. Catherine of Siena had the first visible stigmata, but through humility, she asked that it might be made invisible, and her prayer was heard. Perhaps the most famous is St. Francis of Assisi. In this century, stigmatists have included St. Padre Pio, who was recently canonized by Pope John Paul II, Theresa Neumann of Germany. We could see that she had the stigma because she was wearing gloves, but they were also because uh, of the blood that came from them. We saw parts of that too. And uh, he, the, the pastor, told us that uh, he was convinced that it was absolutely authentic because she lived only on the Holy Eucharist. She received Holy Eucharist at the morning mass, and in order not to create any great wonderment of the people, he would make her receive communion back at the altar. She had a place back at the altar so people couldn't watch her. And he said very often, as he held the host to give it to her on her tongue, of course, he said the host flew into her mouth. And that's all she had for a food. 30 of the stigmatists listed are apparently still living most of them are Catholic. A few come from other faiths, including the Baptist and Anglican churches. A look at some of the lesser known modern day stigmatists can be revealing. Croatian father Slatko Sudak, who bears not only the five wounds of Christ, but who also first received the stigmata on his forehead. Yeah, at the Gamili Clinic in Rome is uh -huh. where the doctor tested him and uh, actually he cut, he cut that wound out entirely. Mm -hmm. And sewed and, it back up. And sewed it up and it also caused tremendous pain mm. to uh, Father Sudats when that happened. And of course what happened though is they, when they finally took the bandage off because he said it was causing a lot of pain, a new, a new scar, a new um, cross. cross had formed. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, when they, when they cut that out, some of the cells were cut in half, but the cells amazingly function as a whole cell, which is, that just doesn't happen. Alan Ames, a lay evangelist and renowned healer, recently revealed that he has also received the stigmata. Did you ask God why this was happening to you? Why he wanted you to experience this? Well, he said he wanted me to share in his love in, in another way, to come to know him in a close, more intimate relationship. And he's also showing me that you know, as he suffered, that sometimes uh, Christians have to suffer. You know, if we're Christ-like, if we imitate Christ, we have to expect there will be suffering in our life. All stigmatists have had to face skeptics and doubting Thomases. One thing that skeptics cannot do effectively is deny that the stigmata exists and that it is even capable of being touched. The fact is, the stigmatas will always be viewed with wonder and awe and trigger a whole range of theological questions involving the nature of God and the relationship between God and all humankind. 
One of the most startling yet unreported cases involves a non-assuming married man from the United States who seeks no publicity and would prefer a hidden and private life away from the world. Through his spiritual guide, a priest, we will be introduced to a man known only as Francis. Father Fox, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, as we've seen, Francis is probably one of the most phenomenal stories that, that we've ever heard, has, has a, amazing charisms. Um, but as you said, he feels called to heal, but not to speak. And you do a lot of the speaking for him and, and explain uh, his story in such beautiful terms, which is quite a gift to you, I, I would imagine. This is what he says. Uh, Jesus did not tell me to speak. Uh -huh. He simply said, touch my people. And he has been doing that with throngs of people across the country and here in the New Orleans area while he's been here. And of course, later in our program, we're going to show some phenomenal video of the healing service that took place. One of how many healing services here? Two or three? It was five of them five on this of, trip. Five of them on this trip where yeah. people um, were healed of various things. People were brought back to the church, possibly healed of ailments. We don't know that yet. You, it might be a while to find that out. Well, I know last year a woman was cl uh, healed of blindness uh -huh. and other things. And uh, But the most important part are the thousands of souls right. that are converted or come back to the church. Okay, but it's an amazing thing to see and the stigmata and the whole bit. We'll be showing that at the end of the program so we want everybody to stick with us. But we want to talk more about Francis and, and give the people a background on how he received these gifts. You know, our Lord never told him to speak. Mm -hmm. He said, touch my people. And so I say, I talked my head off and I don't know if anybody's <laughs> listening, but he just touches people. Right. There's been people cured from cancer, leukemia, um, multiple uh, physical healings, but the most wonderful part are conversions. Not only converts to the Catholic Church, but thousands and thousands of people right. who have been away from the sacraments, who have come back from the Church. Just in the recent days, I've uh -huh. heard hundreds of confessions of people he has prayed over, people away from the church five, ten, twenty, thirty, and more years. That has happened on this trip to New Orleans? It's happened in the last couple of days, right in, in, right in this area, New Orleans. We're going to give a little background on him, but first tell me, what about him praying over them or, or being at your mass and, and hearing you speak, what about all that brought them back after so long? Why was it that? This has to be the Holy Spirit. Uh, I give a homily at the Mass, and I t give a little bit of his history, and um, uh, then when they, when they come forth after the Mass, and he prays over each one, he'll put his, like his hands on their head, on their face, on their shoulders, that they can carry their burdens. He usually cups his one's hands in his stigmatic hands and a lot of them just break down in tears and uh, some of them fall over I guess they call that slain in the spirit right. and they're very restful and so so many of them afterwards they'll get up and go and kneel before the Blessed Sacrament or they look for a priest to go to confession and I, I've heard many many like this was he, was he healed of anything personally? Because oftentimes people who are healed of something physically or, or spiritually are... When he was a little boy, six years old, uh -huh. he was in with, on a farm uh, with, uh, on a horse that he fell off of and hit a railroad track. He was supposed to die. He hit and his head and had a I concussion? Don't, or? When I have the details when I wrote the book, uh -huh. how badly he was injured. I believe the ribs were puncturing uh, the lungs, and they could not operate that night. It would be t too dangerous. The doctor would wait till tomorrow. But in the morning, during the, as morning came, our Lord appeared to him and healed him. And he thinks that's when it all So began. he physically saw Jesus as a six-year-old child? As a child. He, he, this is what he remembers. And did he say but, anything but to him? But after that, his life was normal but until did he 1993. Say anything to him? Did Jesus say anything to him, as you, uh, if you know? 
He said he healed Did he me. say anything to anybody? No, to, to Francis as a six-year-old when he was healing him. No, our he? Lord just stood like this in blessing with white robes. Okay. Just, just, uh, just looking at him and the doctors came and he was healed, six Miraculously years old. Miraculously healed, okay. So now he has a healing ministry many years so later. So he, yes, but before that he, uh, he lived a normal life. He raised a family. He's a grandfather of children. He's now 76 years old. This started in 1993 when our Lord appeared to him uh, during Lent. And with his bleeding hands, the blood was flowing profusely from his hands onto the floor. Uh -huh. And when our Lord disappeared, he said, I was sure there would be blood on the floor, but there was not. And that, that was the beginning. Well, let's, let's talk about that. When he came to him at that point, um, he had a family, as you said. Was he an avid churchgoer, a very holy man at the time, a nominal Catholic? What was he? What kind of an individual was he? He was always a strong practicing Catholic. And um, he went to daily mass. Uh, after he retired, when he could go to daily mass. But since he was a boy, he made the Stations of the Cross every day. When he was a child growing up in Michigan, his father, there was a country church, his father would stay after mass with all of the children, and they would all follow the father around the church making the Stations of the Cross. He kept up that practice to this day. Did he t does he tell you why? Because that's unusual for a child to do that. I mean, that <coughs> the Holy Spirit has a strong hold on you when you do that as a child because you get away from it at, for a while and then sometimes you come back as yeah. an adult. Well, he, he, never, he never got away from it. He, he, he was always trying to evangelize. He was in service during the Second World War. And if there were any Catholic boys he knew who weren't going to sacraments, weren't going to confession, uh -huh. he would arrange it. He always had this spirit of evangelization in him. So he was always a good kid, never, never trouble for his parents, never yeah. some of that raucous Isn't bad that behavior disgusting. kids do. <laughs> wait, wait, is that true, though? He really was? Too good to be true? Hey, I, I, I question whether he ever committed a mortal <laughs> sin. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he looks to me somewhat as for spiritual direction. Uh -huh. and. I got to say, from the time he was a child until 1993, mm -hmm. there were not supernatural, out of the ordinary happenings in his life, except that he always practiced his Catholic faith intensely. He was always devoted to the sufferings of Jesus Christ, never once missing a day, not saying the Stations of the Cross. Now he's out there in, in the mainstream doing this. He must have been astounded at this point in his life when God gave him. Well, see, our Lord said, gifts. "Touch my people," and if I wanted to get him to speak, mm -hmm. as I did everything I could to get to bring him here, for, someday, someday. Uh, but our Lord did not tell me to speak or to preach. He simply said, "Touch my people," and our Lord is working that way with him. Right. But when, when Jesus first appeared to him, what did, what did he tell you he thought about that? Oh. I mean, what, this couldn't be well, happening? Well, you know, or? first of all, it came on Good Friday. He had gone Holy Thursday night to the services, to the Divine Liturgy of Holy Thursday, and he was going to stay until midnight. And about 10.30, uh, his hands start painting so. Mm that he could not stand the pain, and he decided to go home rather than remain until midnight to adore our Lord. And um, they had company that were staying over for the end of the week for Easter, and so uh, he didn't want to awake the company, so he went upstairs and went to bed in the dark. Well, during the night, it started painting more and more, so he went downstairs in the dark to get some pain tablets. He took a couple of pain tablets. It had absolutely no effect. And in the morning, he woke up, and here are those big red purple-like circles in his hands. He didn't know what, the, the, what it was. No blood yet? And the blood was not flowing yet. So he went to see the priest. And the priest looked at him and said, Oh my God, 
<laughs> he got his priest friend, and his priest friend came and looked and said, Oh my God. And he hit all of it. And then pretty soon it starts to bleed. Uh. And this happens every Friday uh, on, in Lent, all during Lent. And each Lent he suffers more. Like it reminds me of the Holy Shroud of Turin, like his arms mm -hmm. are being pulled out yeah. of his socket. But let me ask you, before we, it got to that point, when he first had these spots on his on his palms, did he go to a doctor? Did his priest say, "Let's just take you to a doctor. Let's have you examined first off to make sure it's nothing else"? I mean, obviously the priest thought it was maybe the stigmata, but did he get checked out by any medical person? He has gone to a doctor. These are never bandaged. Right and there has never been infection, the slits are on top. If you see him tonight, you will see he has some big band-aids over the slits. When he's been in ecstasy, I have taken him off and examined him. Mm -hmm. But these are never banished, and they're often open, especially on Fridays, and bleeding. Going to a doctor, yes, when he had to go for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And the doctor looked at it and said, um, this is not my field. <laughs> that <laughs> so he, was it. He didn't tell him this is something your mind has imagined like that, you know, some people. No, he, he, he was embarrassed. Yeah. The doctor was not Catholic. He says, I don't know about these things. And I understand more than one doctor. He's never had to have medication because there's never any infection has ever come. And with these wounds open so much and his... Uh, uh, handling so many things, and you know, uh, if tonight, if I will call him up there at the end of the Mass, if we can get him, in a, he's very, he uses his hands a lot, you can see if I say, put up your hands now so we can film it, oh, you won't get him to do that. He, you know, this is a beautiful thing, if you have a phony mystic, and there's a lot of them around right. today, uh, they want, they want the stage, but not Francis. He would like to be hidden from all of Because it's a hard role to, to carry out in Every many Every night he goes, between 12 o'clock at night and 3 o'clock in the morning, he goes through the Passion of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. It starts with the crowning of thorns, and, and then uh, he goes into ecstasy. I've been with him various times, and he suffers greatly. Um, and I asked him one time, I, it's, it, sometimes he, he puts up his hands like this, and when it's coming to an end, like he's uh, being nailed to the cross, and then his hands gradually come down, and then he relaxes so much so that I'd been afraid he had died, that I could not see his chest going up and down. Right. Just like a, only a couple, two, three breaths, uh, very slightly, a minute. And we have had to put our hand in front to make sure that, it, that he was breathing. The first time I saw it, I was afraid he, he was dying. And I asked him afterwards, because, you know, we could pick him up and carry him out, we're up north, and mm -hmm. take him out and, and lay him on a sidewalk and it's 25 below, he wouldn't know the difference. Right. And, um, so I said, I notice after you relax, uh, what, and, and then you're, you're not suffering anymore. What is happening then? He said, then our Lord is showing me the people for whom I was especially suffering mm. for their conversion. Mm. Let, let me get to that, but I want to ask you something. When, okay, it started with his hands but then it starts every night with the crown of thorns. Does he go through what we've read about? Um, we've done shows with uh, scientists who've investigated the shroud and they've talked about how the Lord really suffered in ways that we probably didn't know about and asphyxiation and all that. Did, is that what he goes through as well then, as well? I, I think the moments something before like his that, death, uh, you know, which was terribly painful. That book, A Doctor on Calvary, they say the body of Jesus was racked. Right. They, they pulled his arms out further than naturally they would have went to prepare the pace for the spiker nail. Right. And Francis is a person who has never done a lot of reading, and um, which is kind of advantageous uh, for me in dealing with him. 
because when he comes to about the fourth or fifth year and the suffering seemed to intensify each Lent, <coughs> and I, he said, Father, uh, I talked to him on a Monday after an Ash Wednesday one year. So we got a long time of Lent to go yet. And I said, uh, he said, oh, Father, he said, my arms just feel like they're being pulled out of their sockets. And, and this, of course, reminded me of the Holy Shroud of Turin. Uh -huh. he, yes, he goes through terrible, terrible right, suffering. And the fact that but he will not speak about his suffering. You get him on this program, he won't tell you anything. When I was writing that book, mm -hmm. he was open with me like a little child. And it's not his nature. Right. Once that book was finished, and I didn't print it till I found out everything mm -hmm. was okay with his bishop, it's, even for me, very difficult. Well, you're his spiritual director. He can't deny you anything, can he? <laughs> um, you got to guide him into yes, these but, things. Yes, but you want to, uh, want to, I'm not, I have not been appointed officially as mm -hmm. his spiritual well, director. Well, how did you become his spiritual director? How did I become? Uh -huh. Just that he chose me. Uh, I went to Michigan to give a, a retreat, and he was there. He came up to me. Uh, the perfume just came out of him and stayed with me for a half hour uh, afterwards. And psychologically, spiritually, we just clicked. Right. And he knew I, I can trust this man. And so phone calls and, well, to Cosa Maria, the sister servants of Eternal right. Word, right. Uh, twice a year we've been giving a retreat there right. and he's always there. They speak very highly of him. They, speak, they yeah. just called before they thought he was coming here to say how wonderful he was. So yeah. they love him dearly. Does he get the wounds on his feet as well? No, he doesn't. Um, no, he doesn't. Um, he gets the pains and stuff on the head, uh, starts with the crown of thorns, but they do not become visible. I don't know whether our Lord intends that for some future date, but of course he's 76 right. already. I think he suffered a lot. Did he ever cry out to God, please take this away? Why me? Please take this away. One time, he, he was exasperated. Mm -hmm. And he said, Dear Lord, I don't want this. And, and wanted it to take away. And shortly afterwards, so he had, he's gotten interior locutions. Mm -hmm. And he said, next day, he said, Oh Lord, I am so sorry I said that. And Jesus said, I never heard you. <laughs> <laughs> I ignored you. <laughs> he said, How? How could Jesus say, I never heard you, would I know I said it? And, and the priest told him, that means uh, Jesus knew he you was, never really meant it. Yeah, he was going to recant. You talked about, but I guess the fact that you started speaking about the fact that he was shown how many souls he was saving, that must have given him the strength. Talk about that, to go on and to endure every single night, all his life now for, with this. Well, what, did, what did he see about the souls being saved, the people being converted? Just full of joy. And when we were coming down here, we knew, because we were here last year, and we couldn't walk down the aisle to get to the altar. So this year they gave out tickets. Not, they did not sell the tickets, but we're having the session five times. Mm -hmm. And this is when you can come so that it's more organized. And on the way down, he knew there would be all of these people with five different sessions. And he said to me, um, we're just going to do this fast. I'm just going to go plop, 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 plop. <laughs> I knew he wouldn't. I knew that he would not do it that way. And once he started, uh, he is completely oblivious of those around him. And if there's 200 or 1,000 more people waiting to come up, he is oblivious. His whole prayer goes out for that one person. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this morning, they also had 250 children come from the school. Oh, really? And he, and he said to me, you know, the little children, I'll right. just do it real quick. As they file out, he took as much time with those little children as the adults. What happened to them? Um, they were, uh, he has a way with children, uh -huh. even before he got this. Uh, and, and with animals, he also has. 
if I try to pick up a child, a cute little child somebody is holding, and let yeah. me hold it, <laughs> and a little kid cries, cries. Friends, would normal. you come to me? It comes to him. So, yeah. so uh, the, the children just come up, and they're so peaceful, and they just smile, and they're so happy. Were any slain in the spirit by him? No. no. Okay. Uh, this particular time... Maybe they don't need it, uh, huh? Uh, there hasn't been... In Birmingham, where we just came from, even one of the sisters went over. Oh, really? And, and, um, but I, to my knowledge, I've been most of the time in the confessional, but I did ask him, and he said no. Uh, one man, I believe I can say this without revealing his sins, um, uh, came to me after being away from uh, a long time, and he said he prayed over me, but I didn't experience anything. And I said, and here you are in a confessional, and you never experienced anything? <laughs> so uh, what I've seen down here is what's happening in the soul, what's happening in the spirit. People away for, uh, I don't want to say the precise number of years, but they certainly have been people away over 30 years that have come back to the church in just the last couple of days that we're down here. And did Jesus um, visually show him souls or people that he had helped? I mean, did he, or did he just talk you mean to him about Afterwards at night, yes. yes, he sees the people. He sees the people that he has helped. And I What ask, does he see? I mean, just sees their faces or he sees them in another state or? Just, um, it's very hard to get him to talk about that. But I did ask him one time, did you ever see a priest? Uh -huh. And he said, two times. And I said, well, what did you think of that? And he said, Father Fox, I, I said, what do you think of that? And he said, Father Fox, what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I think that there are some priests in the world uh -huh. that are not living the true life of what a priest should live. Well, he left it rest there. And, uh, but he, he doesn't necessarily know these people. Right, I understand. He just it. sees them. What about the holy souls in purgatory? Has he had any effect on that? Has Jesus shown him any release of souls for his suffering? Is that part of his ministry? I can't recall that, but you know, since I got in to uh -huh. the Fatima family apostolate, right. I have come into contact with three mystics that have the respect of their bishop. And another one I know, known as Little Mary, mm -hmm. our Blessed Mother has taken her into purgatory. Uh -huh. I don't know if you want to hear about she that. Tell me, yeah. Well, in the, she said, in the purgatory where our Blessed Mother took her, here were these souls, they were like in rags, very sad. It was very difficult to see them through clouds or smoke. And they all had their hands up like this, and she said to our Blessed Mother, you are showing me hell. And the Blessed Mother said, no, it's not hell. They would not be pleading for help and prayers if they were in hell. Then our Blessed Mother took her to the higher re regions of purgatory, and the people were very, very happy, smiling, and light beginning to irradiate from their bodies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's a good question. I've never thought of asking about purgatory, but little Mary, yeah. uh, she looks to me as a, for a spiritual director too, and she just, she, if I can ever get yeah. her down here, she's somebody you'd want to get on. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to get her. I'd like to get Francis too, but let me ask you, because what, I've interviewed a lot of people who have had various spiritual experiences like this, and people who watch the shows, who are skeptics, and people I know, friends of mine, who are still skeptical about all this. One gentleman said to me the other day, he said, I don't know if God wants us to know this much, you know? And, I, and, and my question to you would be, he was, what, 67 when this began? So around 67 well, years old? Well, take off, uh, take off, he's yeah, that'd be about 67. 67 yeah. years old. Um, he's just your average father, family man, and suddenly this happens to him. Why does God choose someone like this, and why does he allow this to happen in our day and age? I know it happened to Padre Pio and other people as well, um, but why, why is this necessary? Help those people out there who, who can't even fathom this, and okay, fine, he's bleeding from his hands, but so what? Why should he have to go through this excruciating pain every single day, one human being? Yes, 
You know, years ago, when I was a boy, and we'd hear about some of this, mm -hmm. it was always a priest or a religious, it seemed. And now, since I set up the Fatima family apostolate, God has brought me in different parts of the world into contact with three people, all married, all uh, parents of children. I think because we are living in such evil times, the devil is trying to destroy the church through the media and scandals. We know that most priests are good priests, but you would never guess at listening to the secular media. And I think because we are living in a time of a crisis of faith, that God is using lay people in a crisis of the family to remind us God does exist. He still works today. He performs miracles today, and we're all called to holiness. Well, I know with um, the people who come in here, um, Francis, and to his healing service, it, it, it's a pivotal point in a lot of their lives, and they do go back to the church. But also help us understand how his suffering every night helps release those souls. Let's say if he, he wasn't aware that that's what was taking place, how, how does that happen? How does God, well, th this is the why does that happen? Why does God use him to do that since they're, you know, they're not even around him or whatever? You know what I'm yeah. saying? This is one of the mysteries of the yes, faith. Yes, it's very communion mysterious. of saints, mm -hmm. the mystical body of Christ, where St. Paul says in the Bible, if one suffers, they all suffer. Right. If one rejoices, they all rejoice. Uh, every, every sin is social. Everyone that commits a sin, that's bad for the entire mystical body, for all the members of the church. When you have somebody especially holy and especially prayerful, that's good for the whole mystical body. So those sufferings are for the conversion of sinners. But why suffering? We're sh tell Explain the power of that suffering like Christ suffered for us. Well, because what? nobody likes to suffer. They don't want to go through cancer. They don't want to go through Alzheimer's. They don't want to suffer, period. Why suffering? Why is suffering so powerful? See, this, this is in the divine providence of God. This is how he ordained we would be saved by his own divine son becoming man, suffering and dying on the cross. And unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, you are not worthy of me. And especially we Americans, we're so materialistic, we want all the comforts, we want no suffering. You know, when I was writing that book, uh, Francis, there was a Jewish woman who was a registered nurse who had recently joined the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And through my magazine, the Immaculate Mary, um, Immaculate Messenger, she learned about Francis. And she wrote me and said, I am a nurse, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my work is to relieve people of suffering. And here you had an article in your magazine about all this suffering that Jesus sent Francis. She said, this isn't the Jesus I know. I wrote her back and said, um, uh, you, uh, then you don't know the same Jesus that I know, because this is how he redeemed the world. And I'm glad she wrote that letter to me because she inspired me to write a chapter on redemptive suffering. Okay. I would not have thought of doing that if she hadn't written that letter to me. And, and we're supposed to unite all of our sufferings to the sufferings of Jesus, meritorious in reparation, first of all, for our own sins and the sins of others. And, and the sacrifice of the cross and the redemptive suffering you're talking about does not uh, diminish at all that God is a loving, merciful God. Because people get that confused, I think. Well, wait a minute. This isn't the good guy I know upstairs. You know, this is too harsh. It's God's mercy that we can even be saved and that we can have a sin forgiven. Jesus, the head of the mystical yeah. body, had to suffer, had to die on the cross. Right. And unless you take up your cross daily, not once in a while, but daily, and follow me, you are not worthy of me. And so we're to unite our sufferings to the sufferings of our Lord. Let me ask you, um, um, Francis obviously has a cross every night. Every but, night. Every night. But he's got a daily cross, too, because, as we said, he's not a public man by... Um, by nature. By nature. Uh, but, of course, now he's become very public. That must have been very difficult on his personal life, in his marriage. How did his wife take it in the beginning? Uh, it almost divided them? Uh, just about. Yeah? Um, and his family was afraid to come home. Well, why, why the relationship rift with his wife? She didn't understand it, or there were too many people coming around, or what happened? 
People were ignoring her. They would. St she's a very outgoing person. Right. They would step over her and go for Francis. They did not realize what they were doing to the family. And uh, they would be at the home. People would come to the home as if it was a public church. The children would come and see all these people there, and they would go away. They were afraid to come home. And, and you know, they'd been married a long time when this happened. He didn't show this to his wife the first couple of weeks. Yeah. And, and I, I think it was two to three weeks. And one day she said, you know, you could help me with this. And he said, I can't. And he held up his hands like that. And she looked and knew immediately what it was. And she went over and, and started weeping. But the first time he had this ministry like for a couple of years, and they had never been open with it, about it to each other. She had never asked him to pray over her hmm. till they came to my parish in Alexandria, South Dakota. And of course, I'm a priest journalist, and I knew what this could do for people. Uh, that tens of thousands of people could be touched through the book mm -hmm. that he would never physically be able to touch. And so I got him to come to my parish years ago, and she saw, and I talked to each of them privately, and she got him, she sat there where all of them went up, and when the last person is gone up, she said, do you suppose I could go up and have him pray over me oh, wow. too? <laughs> and then they broke down and cried, and she told me when the book came out in their area, mm -hmm. It had a great leveling effect. People realized what they were doing to this family. Right. But it brought them close together then. But did she, was she angry at God in the beginning, not no. truly understanding this? No, she this? said to me in plain words, uh, I am, I do not mind at all sharing him with Jesus. Uh -huh. It's just that people did not understand. It was mostly what outsiders were doing sure. to them. It's a shock to people, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and they just thought they owned him. Mm -hmm. and, and it was putting a wall between he and his wife. But when the book came out and people read the book, and when I talked to both of them, and, and I said, you know, you, when you're married, you become one. So this charism, this cross that he has, this is part of your cross, too. And as far as you know, she's never witnessed him in the Passion. Yes, and, and then shortly after this, she had a heart attack that she just about oh. died. Oh. And that really cinched it to really bring them together. Yeah. What impact has Francis had on your life? Must be phenomenal. Gee, I really don't know. I, 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 uh, God has been very good to me and give, gave me a great gift of faith from the time I was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And I just take these things in passing. Padre Pio, when I was growing up, uh, he, he, he fascinated me so much. And a little boy, you don't know a lot of theology or apologetics. And I would say, um, our church got to be the true church. We got Padre Pio, a mm -hmm. little guy, nine, ten years old. I told the children that this morning. And, um, and he's not the first stigmatist that I have become acquainted with. Another one was in Italy, but I, I don't want to get into that. Um, I, I, he must I, have had a profound impact in some fashion. I mean, to, to be hand-picked by him and obviously inspired by God to pick you, that must be kind of overwhelming for you, a little bit. Could have been a bunch of priests out there that would have been picked. I mean, there are lots of priests out there. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. Uh -huh. I. I I, I is it a cross? Is it a gift for you, though? Oh, it's 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 a gift, and I just appreciate it so much. I, I certainly am not a wor worthy of it. I can see other priests much more holy and more worthy and more knowledgeable than I am. But uh, it, it, God, I tell uh, Francis, I said, the reason you were chosen because you're so miserable. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the uh, Lord has said this like uh, St. Margaret Eloquo. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just a lowly soul. Pick someone more sophisticated, more educated. <laughs> and and, and uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus said, if I know you're lowly. If I could have found one more lowly, I would have chosen that soul. Right. So part of this is serious. Part of it is joking. I say to Francis, um, you were so lowly and so miserable. 
that's why God chose you. <laughs> but he gets back at me too. Sure. Let me ask you, when he prays over people, because we're going to film this and we're going to show um, our audience his prayer service, what prayers, which prayers does he choose? Or does he just... Oh, he did. They come spontaneously. They come does he sp pray in tongues? He or? does not. No, he doesn't talk out loud. Uh, he, 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 if I listen real close when he prays over me privately, I can hear him say, you know, that what most persons want to do is come up and give a clinical report. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, use, I say, when you're lining up in line, Jesus and Mary know exactly why you want him to pray over him. Right, absolutely. And if you're going to say anything, just say one sentence. They know all the rest. Uh, uh, he, he uses he, no relics of any sort. Pardon? He uses no relics or any special no, metals or anything. No, just his hands. His hands would be like the hands of Jesus. Right. Uh, Jesus is using his hands, and, and the stigmata is all the way through. But he's not bleeding at the time. He doesn't bleed until about 1 o'clock in the morning, you said? Um, he doesn't. It, often afterwards, they, they have become open mm -hmm. and bleed somewhat, but not flowing profusely. Right. That that usually comes on Friday and during Lent. Right. Um, his hands become so very hot. And you can Recently, feel that I noticed they had. A, I think it was last night they had. He asked him to have a little tub of ice cubes. His hands become so hot when he prays over people. Once in a while, he turns around and puts his hands in those ice cubes. Mm. And little Mary, the same way, her hands become very hot uh, when she prays over people. And of course, another time, Myrna of, of uh, Damascus, mm -hmm. um, uh, similar gifts, and, 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 and I, I think the reason, you know, I found it the apostolate for the holiness of the family. And I think this is why the Holy Spirit has brought me into union with these people. Mm -hmm. Not because of anything special about myself. And because he's affecting so many families out, of, out there by affecting the individuals. Any other um, charisms or gifts that he's been given that we haven't discussed? Well, these interior locutions. And what other things? What is Jesus telling him? What is what? Jesus telling him. It's Jesus speaking to him? Jesus, the last, the last time Jesus spoke to him was when he and I went to Fatima together. And um, in the early stages, because this was so new, he had to be formed by Mary and Jesus. And the last time that he had an interior locution <coughs> was when he went with me with a group to spend a couple weeks at Fatima. Mm -hmm. And the messages he receives are not for other people. Okay. The messages little Mary receives are for the world. His messages are just for himself. The stigmata in touching people, that's for other people. Are they messages to keep him strong during this? Or? To give him, increase his faith and his love to give him courage to go on. Right. They're just for him. The, and in the book, you will find the messages okay. that he has received, most of them anyway. All right, and we're talking about the book Francis by Father Robert J. Fox, and you can buy this where? In most of the religious stores out there? Uh, well, there are some religious stores that have it, but my apostolate is where most people are getting it from. Well, give us that. You have a um, website? Fatima Family Apostolate. www.fatimafamily.org, Fatima. I okay, believe it is. Okay, yeah. and they can get your book and find out more information. Thank you, Father. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Countless believers who already know of the mission of Francis have been touched by him in the name of Jesus Christ. During the healing missions given by Francis, many have received both spiritual and physical healings. But for the vast number of you who have not heard of Francis or who have been unable to attend his astounding healing services, what you are about to share in is the rare opportunity to participate in a live healing service where miracles happen as Francis begins to pray over all of those who believe in the healing power of God, whether they are present and praying in the church or watching and praying from their own homes. 
the Holy Spirit knows no bounds. Since I got into the apostolate, the Fatima family apostolate, the Holy Spirit is bringing me into union with various mystics recognized by their bishops. Miraculous, tremendous things happen. They're all lay people. They're all married people. They're all people who have children. I think there's a message for that. Because the apostolate is for the holiness of the family. Francis is with us tonight, who since 1993 has the bleeding wound marks of Jesus Christ in his hands. I met him shortly after this happened. Now we started when the journey left that year when our Lord was before him with his bleeding hands, blood profusely from our Lord, dripping onto the floor. And Francis told me, I was sure that after our Lord disappeared, when I looked down at the floor, that there would be blood. But there was not. And then, starting on Good Friday that year, he received the bleeding wound marks of our Lord. Every night, even Christmas night, he goes to between 12 o'clock at night and 3 o'clock in the morning, he goes to the suffering of Jesus Christ. It starts with the crowning of thorns. <clears throat> now, I wonder why in the world, between 12 o'clock at night and 3 o'clock in the morning, see, yeah, I'm just a farm boy from South Dakota, and I'm very naive, and they, they, I was told, because that's when most mortal sins are committed. And I said, well, if I wanted to commit mortal sin, I wouldn't wake up at night. But some young priests said, being a pretty naive father, I come from a little town, you know, up, up in the Dakotas. And it starts with the crowning of thorns, and I've seen Francis in ecstasy undergoing the suffering repeatedly. The book over there is over there, Francis, that goes into great detail. Now, our Lord did not ask him to speak. I get letters, phone calls. You suppose you could influence uh, Francis to uh, come to our parish and speak. I said, are you kidding? He's right with me. He lets me do all the talking. He says, our Lord did not tell me to speak or preach. He told me, touch my people. Touch my people. I talk to my young ones now, and I wonder if anybody is listening Francis doesn't say a word, and he's bringing thousands back to the church. People have been cured of leukemia, various kinds of cancer. I know one young man I talked to him about two weeks ago, great big cancer growth on his neck. Francis prayed over him. And when he was going home in the car with his mother, the car was suddenly full of perfume. And, uh, uh, it was gone. First time I met him, I experienced the perfume. Not since, just the first time. And it stayed with me for about a half hour afterwards. Um, we were here a year ago. That's why they got those tickets that you know come in one night. And um, they couldn't walk down the aisle then. And uh, I heard very one thing I remember. One lady who was blind and received her flight back. But the, the important thing is not the physical healing, but the thousands of people who have been converted to the Catholic Church, or Catholics who were not doing the sacraments, were away and came back to the church. I heard confessions in, uh, here and other places when Francis prayed over people, touched them. My last confession was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I haven't been to confession since I got out of the eighth or the twelfth grade. I've heard this sort of thing again and again. And all I need to do is pray over them. Put his hand on them. 
Now you will notice you put his hands on your head and on your face, I think on your face too, on your shoulders, so you'll be able to carry the burden and cup your hands in his hands. Now you don't have to go and tell him that you're coming out of the kitchen. You want to present to him to pray for. And it's that long. Did, did you ever ask some people, how are you? And they tell you. <laughs> they think, how are you? Uh, that you're asking for a clinical report. <laughs> when you're lining up, you come up to have Francis pray over you. <coughs> Jesus and Mary knows exactly what's in your heart. Some children, an unfaithful spouse, a cancer you may have, somebody else may have, what is hurting you, the healing that you need for yourself and for others. God knows that. If you say anything to Francis, boil it down to one little sentence. Just one little sentence. When you come out, just give it one little sentence, one little sentence, for my children, that my children come back to the church, that I be here of cancer. It's just like that. All the rest, Jesus knows. Francis doesn't cure anybody. But he uses God, uses him as the instrument. And it doesn't depend on his understanding. Jesus already knows. And um, I think I've already said too much. And the rest you can go over there and hear and read it.
to the new covenant, and we have been discussing the role of the cross and suffering in living an authentic Catholic Christian life. And I have a guest for this part of the program, Francis. I, we made some programs here five years ago and um, were well received. And I want to give you a little background here on Francis. In 1993, he received the wound marks in his hands on Good Friday. And every night, after 12 o'clock, between 12 and 3, he goes through the sufferings of Jesus Christ. I have been with him various times when he goes through this, these sufferings. And I do want to say, those who want information about Francis, please do not be writing EWTN. We tell you on this program how you can get the various books. I've written the book on his life, Francis, and with our Fatima family apostolate, you are able to get these books. People, you know, want to go to his state to his home and they have no idea what they're doing and when they phone me or write me I say have you got the book have you read the book you read the book first then you know what you are doing and when we interview someone like this this doesn't mean that EWTN is giving giving a blanket endorsement although I can say that Francis Bishop he certainly has given you support, hasn't he? He sure has. He called you in. What did he say when he called you in? <laughs> oh, there was many things, Father. Let's not go into that. Well, what, what he says, uh, he, I want you to know uh, you have my support. support. And uh, our Lord did not tell you to go out and speak to people. This is rather an exception. He said, touch my touch people. Touch my children. And you pray over them and touch them. And uh, this starts in 1993. How many people would you say you have touched and prayed over by now? He told me it's approximately 60,000. Approximately 60,000. 60,000. What happens to these all people? all over the country, you know. <laughs> what happens to them when you pray over them and touch them? You don't hear back from all of them. It's just impossible. But so many, so many report to their priest and different committees and letters that I get. How does the Lord touch them and their family? And what, you know, uh, and that's just beautiful to see. Because there are physical healings. And there are people coming back to the church and the sacraments. And just from reading that book, Father. What what effect, you know, when I, I, I was writing this book, I, Francis, when I, at that time I would ask him questions and he would ask, answer all my questions. I don't even know if you realize that I was asking you at the time to get information for the book. But after the, the book was published, which he never read the book, it's been like pulling hen's teeth to get information out of him about the suffering that he goes through at night and the like. Your, your wife told me she read the book and she learned a lot of things about you she did not know no, that's uh, about you know the sufferings and the, yeah. and the reason I have you on this program because during this series reclaiming your children for the faith I have been emphasizing that prayer and suffering is essential for conversion and reconversions my estimate is that thousands of people through the mission Jesus has given you have come back to the sacrament oh yes that's what these priests tell me and uh, different ones on these committees. Uh, and it's so wonderful here. I'd rather see that than a physical healing because this is healing of the soul. And when you pray over people, are, pe are priests hearing confessions? Oh, <laughs> you should see some of them when there's like 2,000 or so at these larger churches. They'll have five to six priests. I heard and one of eight priests here in Yeah, and, and uh, the lines up are over a half a block line on all of them. And I heard and one that priest that me. for a month afterwards, people were coming back. My last confession was yes, 10, he, 20, 30 years ago. He told you that. Uh, I mean, That's what I heard from mm -hmm. a priest. Yes. And a lot, a lot of fallen ways mm -hmm. have come back to the church. Definitely. Um, what do people tell you? Who have read the book? Uh, that book, uh, Father, has touched many, many. 
Now, uh, I have letters home. Different priests have letters. My brother has them. Kathy Crombie has them. <coughs> of people that read that book, doesn't know me or doesn't know you or my family, and they've written a letter, this book made me come back to my faith. That's wonderful. So it must be a... Because, you know, you, you know, God didn't give you this mission. I think it starts at the age of 70... Uh, well, in your 70s anyway, early 70s. Yeah, well, sixty nine. And, well, and, 69, and your family has grown up and, and, and they're married. You have grandchildren. And I, I, and I know, I, I've seen you hour after hour praying over people. As a rule, you don't travel to do this anymore. And um, just stop that. Yeah, you used to, used to travel, yeah. but you're getting older, you just can't do this. And people have no idea what it takes out of you. My idea was that through the book, tens of thousands, of, we, the first printing was 10,000 and sold mm -hmm. out in a short time. Many people you could touch, you would not be able to touch physically. That's right. You're right. And, and that was my plan, and you're telling me that is what is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, what, tell us about some of the impressive things that impressed you that when people have come forth. What, what, what most impresses you? You know, this this will probably sound strange to a lot of people. But when they come forward and you touch them and they start crying, that means so much to me. When they cry. Uh, I, uh, just, just like you do so easily. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, I've seen people, you know, that just uh, go over backwards. They call it slain in the spirit. And, of course, once in a while, there's some people who want attention, and they put on an act, and, that's, and, that's and they're quite right. easy. They're quite but easy. this crying is coming from the heart. Yeah. And, uh, when, when, when they cry, and then they, they I, I've seen them, and then they get up, and they go over the knee before the Blessed Sacrament. Before the Blessed Sacrament. And then they right look around, is a priest hearing confession? Yes. I've, I've heard confessions uh, after you were uh, touching people. Do you think uh, your mission has concerned holiness of the family, a call for the holiness of the family yeah. in some way? I think so, Father. I think so. There's a lot of families now. You know, I don't like to talk about this. I know, I, like you about I know you don't. I know you don't. He finds it very difficult to talk about the suffering. Even I, as far as I know, I'm you know I'm the only one that uh, talked to you one time when you were in ecstasy at night, but you didn't remember it the next day. And at that time, I asked you about the suffering. Even when you were in ecstasy, uh, you wouldn't tell me. The first time I met Frances, um, just uh, perfume. What was all around you, but never again. But other people mm -hmm. have told me, told me uh, they experienced this, and th this was a sign to me of authenticity. And I knew I wasn't I imagining it. How how have you ever talked to young people? Well, how do they, how oh, young people respond? I love to be with the teenagers. And about a year ago, I was with uh, 300 in the town near Ann Arbor, and that touched me more than probably I touched them because I could see these teenagers. They'd come up crying and they'd want to apologize to me what they've been doing. And I'd say, there's many preachers here hearing confessions. Talk to them. And they, knew, and they know about the, the wound marks? Oh, and... yeah. yeah. Mm. They were told ahead of time. Yeah. But I just love working with the youth, Father. And if they know oh. that you love them and tell them the truth, that's yeah. the problem. Not enough people are telling them the truth. Yeah. Now, if you met someone that you know has left the Catholic Church, what would you say to them? I'm never afraid to talk to them about it. But, Father, you have to be awfully careful. You have some that are bitter some that just faded away, some that are lukewarm. You handle them all different. Yes. Uh, the bitter one, you got to move slow. 
<laughs> now, if somebody is real bitter and they know that God has given you this charism, mm -hmm. you still have to be very careful. Very careful. Give us an example careful. of what you might do or say. I ask them, um, you know, you want to come to church with me someday? Or someday I'll pick you up. Or we'll do this or that. And we we'll go in the afternoon if you wish. And they say, no, 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 no. I say, you know, that hurts me. Because eternity is a long time. You actually say that hurts me. You bet. Me. That hurts me. Oh, that hurts me when people... That's what parents should be saying to their children and don't practice, yeah. right? Eternity is a long time, buddy. Mm -hmm. And would you tell them what they're missing? Yes. Oh, yes. For example? That Eucharist. Our Mass and our Eucharist mm -hmm. that they walked away from. And you know it's sad, there's so many today now that haven't had any Christianity or religion in the home. Yeah. And these kids grew up uh, with none of that. Mm -hmm. I think those can be touched because I know our little group at home have gotten You know, Francis, since I found it, it's, it's the beginning close to 17 years ago now, the Fatima family apostolate for the holiness of the family. Mm -hmm. God has brought me into contact, uh, contact with three persons who have special charisms like yours, and, and every one of them are married. I recently returned from Syria with a, this woman gets the stigmata, uh, a lady of Sophonia. And God seems to be working to marry people, to bring people back to the truth. Oh, now, I know you don't like to talk about the sufferings, but at night, and I've seen you go through the sufferings, and then all of a sudden you relax. Does God let you know who you were especially suffering for? I mean, does He, does he give you a name? Does He show you no, the person? No, 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 no names. Uh, he shows me groups. I think I went that far with you. You know, it's hard when I hate to discuss something that I feel is personal between me and our Lord. Yes. Uh, even to discuss it with you, I know it's hard for me to discuss it with the whole world. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> so. But you can help so many people. You can help. Hey, you one time told me, but, and I ask you, you know, I see you go through this suffering and your hands are up like that and pretty soon you go... And, and I thought, the man, I was, your brother, Ren, was with me. I said, <coughs> he's not breathing. And yeah, you, know, you could just breathe. And then you took a deep breath, and you were relaxed. I shouted in your ears, Francis, as loud as I could. I couldn't, I couldn't even get you to blink your eyelids. And I asked you afterwards, um, what is happening? And you said, our Lord is then showing me the people I have been suffering for. And uh, he goes through tremendous suffering of the crucifixion. It starts with the crowning of, of the thorns. At, 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 whenever you, you have been out, uh, been with me, it always starts at the stroke of midnight because most mortal sins are committed after midnight. Yeah, between 12 and 3. And see, he's suffering to save souls, and this ought to get the point across. If you want to bring a reclaimed person who has left the church not practicing the faith, you're going to have to pray. You're going to have to do some suffering. Agree? Right. Right. And, and um, you know, people don't offer up. I talk to so many. They don't offer up their day. And they're... They seem to be uh, good churchgoers and stuff, but you bring that up to them. What do you mean, uh, offer your day? Yeah. And I tell them, don't put your feet on the floor in the morning until you offer that day up to Jesus. He offered himself up to us. So I am really working hard on that now, of getting people to... I spoke to a group the other night, yeah. and... Uh, I really stressed on that. That's the morning off and all oh, yeah, Jesus to you, my Mary, so Mary offer thee all my prayers for you. And sufferings of this of day. Of this day, yeah. I was taught in the seminary, as soon as that alarm goes off, be, to say, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. And mm -hmm. I think 
that many people don't realize by the slightest little thing. St. Teresa of Lisieux taught us the little white, the little, a little flower, even picking up a pin we see on the floor, mm -hmm. can be meritorious for the salvation of soul. I can remember when, when we were all little kids on the farm, I can remember my mother saying this, and this many years ago. Did you say your morning prayers now, boys? Well, thank you, Francis, for being on this program, um, showing us the great value of suffering for the conversions of people. Used to be here.